this talk is going to be on the value of chromosomal information uh, for studies in salmonid evolution, uh, population genetics, and transcriptomics. So this work uh, was largely done at Université Laval in Quebec City uh, in Louis Bernachet's lab. Uh, I'm now with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the University of British Columbia. We're now in the age of uh, Salmona genomics. Uh, there's all these new resources available. You can see here, this is the, the new version of the McQueen et al. Uh, table from Eric uh, Rondeau. Uh, presented this earlier yesterday or the day before. And it basically just shows all of the different Salmona genomes that are either uh, in a, a late stage of uh, genome assembly or even chromosome anchoring or transcriptome assembly. So that's really exciting that we have all these new resources and as people continue to use them uh, it'll be important to consider this uh, chromosomal information. Not all genomes really need to be uh, at a chromosome level assembly. There's a lot that you can do um, with just a contig level assembly. Uh, for example here if you're designing an amplicon panel uh, and you just have a bunch of rad markers and you want to extend out those rad markers and design primers as we've heard a lot about at this conference like uh, GTSeq, uh, various other amplicon approaches you just can extend your contigs and you don't need to have chromosomal information uh, to do that type of thing but there are a lot of things that you can do with chromosomal information that you would miss out if you had random contigs that are just kind of floating in uh, in, in genome space in an unknown orientation, unknown position. Uh, for example, when we saw some great examples of uh, genome-wide association studies uh, that use highly dense markers, this is just a, a, a QTL scan for uh, uh, some phenotype in brook char. And basically you scan along the chromosomes and look for when your peaks pass your threshold of uh, significance and you say okay there's probably something in this region that's related to this trait that you're interested in so that you need either a genetic map or a, a, or a whole genome assembly on chromosomes but there are other things too that are maybe used a little bit less like uh, looking at recombination rate across chromosomes or nucleotide diversity like uh, Pi here is shown from Lightwin et al. Um, in 2016 in, in brown trout. They showed that there's elevated Pi at the uh, edges of chromosomes. And they, they talked about this being related to potentially uh, residual tetraploidy in salmonids. So that's the type of thing that if those markers were just floating in random space, you wouldn't see those types of patterns. Also, of course, we've seen about uh, islands of divergence. If you're looking at um, either different ecotypes or different uh, when, when species are forming and you want to see you know, FST across a chromosome and you see these islands of divergence, there's another, if we didn't have the orientation, we wouldn't see the island. We just see basically there's a collection of markers that have elevated FST. Um, also, inversions, large-scale st structural rearrangements, uh, for example, in our 2016 paper where we were looking at different uh, species of salmonids and seeing these large-scale inversions occurring, we'll be seeing a lot more studies coming out with uh, inversions in the near future as these uh, chromosome-level assemblies continue to be uh, investigated. So. In salmonids, this stuff is really relevant because that salmonid genome is quite unique. The salmonid ancestor uh, underwent a whole genome duplication, so we think that you know there's our little cartoon of uh, 25 acrocentric chromosomes, and then boom, there's a whole genome duplication event, so each chromosome is doubled and then kept. Uh, that's the key point. It, it, it's not in a tetraploid state anymore. Uh, it goes back to a diploid state, but it retains all that genetic information. Um, and an interesting th thing that happens uh, in salmonids is, yes, a lot of the genome went back to uh, a diploid state. There were still some chromosomes that can uh, continue recombining between homeologs. Uh, for example, I'll just explain this briefly in this cartoon. So typically you'd have... Um, 
uh, recombination between homologs in one individual where you know the chromosome you got from your mom and the chromosome you got from your dad they can recombine well in salmonids for specific chromosomes uh, you can also continue to get recombination occurring between homeologs for specific chromosomes across the genome. So uh, just here, you know, chromosome 1.1 meaning duplicate 1 and chromosome 1.2 meaning duplicate 2. So this is a really interesting uh, area of study. Uh, it's shown really well by this Waples et al. paper from 2016 where they show all the linkage groups for chum salmon and you can see on the telomeric ends of several of these linkage groups, there's these connections, and that indicates paralogs that um, are basically representing uh, instances where there is likely still recombination going on between um, eight pairs of uh, chromosome arms, consistently those eight pairs. So these uh, homeologs are still uh, recombining, whereas you know, over here, there's no recombination still happening between uh, ancient uh, duplicated pairs as this has been fully redipletized. So that has some pretty significant effects. If you're in those homologous regions, you're going to be, you're going to have different uh, evolutionary genetics going on. You're going to have problems in genetic map construction or just genotyping. You know, you're going to have potentially uh, more than two alleles at that uh, locus. Um, there's been some studies that show that, uh, we, that, that, that you can get the same uh, population structure if you're using paralogous or non-paralogous loci in chum salmon, but these regions can get lost if, you're, if they're not treated appropriately in, uh, in genetic mapping. So all these genetic maps are all these different species. What we did uh, in 2016 was we took all these maps and we connected them all to each other using a method called MapComp. You can read more about it in our uh, 2016 paper. Um, and since then, there's been other genetic maps ha that have come out. So those weren't included in this comparison, uh, but uh, we could uh, continue to update these correspondence tables um, so basically this is the correspondence table. Remember I said there was 25 chromosomes in the ancestor. It looks really like this northern pike outgroup. Um, so basically what we've done here is we have all of the linkage groups from all the different salmonids corresponding to either the, the first or second uh, duplicate of this you know, single chromosome in northern pike all the way down to 25.2. So we have all these orthologous relationships for all these different species. And when you have that, you can start looking at chromosome fusion events. Um, in Salmonids, you can get two acrocentric chromosomes binding together to make a metacentric chromosome. And you can kind of watch this cascading uh, fusion-fission uh, activity that occurs um, over the evolutionary history of Salmonids. And you can read more about that in our Genome Biology and Evolution paper. And this just shows that the uh, homeologous chromosomes, which uh, are still recombining, which were identified in all these different studies, uh, are in fact the same pairs in uh, all of the characterized Salmonids, with one exception here, that if you want to read more about that exception and our bit of speculation about why that might be an exception in regards to chromosomal fusion formations, um, I invite you to please uh, check out this, this article here. Um, so that type of correspondence can bring really new uh, and exciting information when you look across species. For example, these are just a few papers that I pulled out of the literature. Uh, Pritchard et al. recently looked at uh, Atlantic salmon and sockeye salmon found corresponding uh, regions that are associated with similar phenotypes. Uh, Larson et al. found uh, QTL hotspots uh, in sockeye and found that these were also related to similar phenotypes in other species. Uh, and I added this one after hearing all about Greb 1L at the conference we're at here. Um, and that looked at the same region across two uh, species, steelhead and chinook salmon. So you can gain kind of insight on evolutionarily conserved um, um, functions if you look across species like that. And using that sort of nomenclature of 
uh, 0.1, 0.2 tying back to the Northern Pike can be really beneficial. This is a table from our G3 paper of 2017 where we look at all the known sex chromosomes. And if you just look at them this way, that's what they're named in the studies, it doesn't really tell you that much. But if you look at them from their ancestral chromosomes, uh, that can give you some new insight because, you know, look, we're, we're here, we're seeing the same chromosomes being reused as the sex chromosome in multiple different species. I don't have much time to go into this, but um, we think it, it could potentially be that the, uh, these chromosomes are just acting as really useful for being a sex chromosome, so they might be converging on these sex chromosomes, but that requires more exploration. Um, and further to the, you know, the chromosomal position of your markers in, uh, in, in salmonids, of course, you know, whether it's in a residually tetraploid or if it's in a, if it's in a diploid region is important, but also if it's a male or a female, the recombination patterns are quite different in uh, salmonids where in males you get recombination events basically always occurring at the telomeric regions where as in females you get it kind of occurring across the entire chromosome. Um, and this can have effects on population genetics. In Benistan et al, um, uh, we showed that basically uh, in two different species the biggest thing driving any structure or separation in our DAPC was uh, sex and a lot of the markers that were uh, top loading in this DAPC were actually on the sex chromosome. So ignoring uh, whether a marker is on the sex chromosome or not can be detrimental and can lead to spurious results if you're not um, uh, aware of it. Um, so finally I'm just going to wrap up quickly uh, about transcriptomics. People don't usually think about transcriptomics in, in the context of you know, genomic location or chromosomal location. Um, but, so we generated this, uh, this uh, network, gene expression network based on correlation of, of genes uh, just kind of shown like in this um, co-expression network diagram from Prieto et al. Uh, we did that in Brookchar for 100 full sieb individuals and I placed all of the 20,000 Brookchar transcripts on the Atlantic Salmon genome. So this just shows the chromosome number and the percentage of genes that are in each chromosome in all of those approximate 20,000 genes. And then we take various modules, like they call this the green module, the salmon module, and you see that this uh, chromosome 20 is actually enriched four genes from that module and same with chromosome 26 here um, and 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 this actually just shows where those genes are on those two uh, chromosomes for those two modules and if you look at a different network one that was built with males um, I want to direct your attention to this yellow green module even though it only has a you know a, a small number of genes in it it was really interesting to see that chromosome 13 and chromosome 3 were both enriched uh, from this module. And you can see chromosome 13 here has the genes uh, weighted towards this side of the chromosome um, in both of these chromosomes from Atlantic salmon. The really interesting thing was, was that when I looked at the chromosome correspondence table, it turned out that in Brookchar, the, the, the distal uh, arm, the B arm of those, or the Q arm of those two chromosomes are actually fused into one. So in fact, this yellow-green module is enriched across um, the entire uh, Brookchar 08 uh, chromosome. So that really indicated to me that this, this method was working. And uh, it's just kind of a different way of looking at uh, co-expression and positional information in gene expression studies looking at chromosomal enrichment. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of different things that you can do with chromosomes once you've got them. I mean it's uh, yeah the and this is just you know a few examples. I'm sure there'll be lots more that we are finding out uh, as these genomes get analyzed further. With that, I'd just like to wrap up. This work uh, was funded by these groups shown here, and I'd like to thank, uh, of course, Louis Bernachet, who supervised a lot of this work, and Eric Normando, who is a scripting wizard, and uh, Yanni Proika, who helped me with a lot of the co-expression network analysis.